I'd like to welcome Dr. Rebecca Johnson. Thank you so much, Chloe. There's, there's only one thing worse than listening to a long, boring bio about someone else, and that's listening to one about yourself. <laughs> So I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Noongar people, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and also to any emerging people from the Noongar. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders joining us in the room tonight. Well, um, as you've heard, I'm um, a wildlife forensic scientist, a conservation geneticist, and uh, it took a long time to appoint a female into my role as the director of science at the Australian Museum. Uh, and so, so tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about my science journey to date. Um, and it actually starts off um, almost, I do, I call myself an accidental wildlife forensic scientist of sorts. Um, but, but, but I think you'll learn that um, nothing that we actually do in science is that accidental. It, there, there are a lot of opportunities that can be taken and that, that will be my theme throughout this evening. Uh, so I thought I'd tell you a story about how I got into being a wildlife forensic scientist. Um, the field didn't even exist <laughs> when it started. So back in 2004, um, was, which was just after I started at the Australian Museum, I've been there 15 years. Yes, I'm, I'm that old. Um, I, I had a phone call from the New South Wales Police and they said to me, um, we've, got, uh, we've got this blood sample and is there any way that you could tell us if this blood sample came from a cockatoo? And I was like, oh, okay, well, this is um, not exactly the kind of inquiry that I thought I was going to be getting within a couple of weeks of starting work at the museum, uh, where I had started as a junior lab manager um, at, at the museum. And they said, you know, so the story was that, this, um, that there was a park just south of Sydney where it, lots of families would go every single day to feed this flock of basically semi-tame cockatoos. So every day, lots of people would go, they would feed these birds, um, on this particular day, this, a car came driving across the park and seemed to have intentionally run over the entire cock of flock, the flock of cockatoos. Um, and so, so this happened in front of a lot of witnesses. People were very upset because a, at least 20 birds were either killed immediately or had to be euthanised because they were so badly injured. And um, obviously there were so many witnesses that they, there were reports to police, the number plate was reported. The police investigated the scene and the person that was involved said, no, no, I had nothing to do with that, you've got the wrong person. But they, they decided to further investigate his vehicle and they found this blood sample, which is how, how they came to be phoning up, up me at the Australian Museum. I, I later found out they have this expert referral team where they, they, ask the, they have the wackiest questions that go to the expert referral team and they just basically ring around every, every scientist they can think of that might be able to help them with their questions. And so, so I, was, I thought to myself, Oh, I'm a geneticist, I'm an evolutionary geneticist, so I'm, I can, I, I'm pretty good at um, determining how things are related using DNA, and I work at a museum and we have 21 million specimens in our collection, I'm pretty sure I could find a cockatoo in there that would be a reference sample. So I said, yeah, yeah, sure, you bring, bring your blood sample in and I can help you with the identification. Um, so, so the question being, is, is this from a cockatoo or not? Oh, I, I don't need to tell any of you that just from looking at this blood sample, you wouldn't be able to tell what it was. Um, and it, lo and behold, uh, yes, it did turn into, it turned out to be a sulfur-crested cockatoo blood sample. Um, it it d did end up all the way in court because he didn't, um, he, he wouldn't plead guilty until he ended up with all of the evidence in front of him. And it turned out he, he didn't have a licence because he had already, uh, had a manslaughter conviction against him. He'd already killed a person with his car. Um, so, so this was not someone that should have been driving a, a vehicle anyway. But for me as a scientist, I thought, um, wow, this is actually a pretty cool use of science. This, this is uh, a great application of something that I spent a lot of years studying and a, a place where I get to work where I have lots of um, sp specimens where I can use as reference material. And, and wow, we can actually do really good with this work. 
Um, so 14 years later, um, I, I have developed, uh, we have the only accredited forensic laboratory that deals with wildlife in the country. Um, I have a whole team of people that do this, this kind of work day to day. And, and unfortunately, this is a cross section of the kind of samples that we deal with. That it, wildlife crime is, is something that um, it, it really knows no boundaries. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But this is just an example of just a handful of the type of things that come across our desk. Um, but, but also as scientists, I think a lot of us, well most of us go into it to make a difference in some way. And this was something for me that I thought, wow, this is not being done before, this is, this is a great use of my skills and th there seemed to be a need for it. Um, and just in case you're wondering, the police labs that, that would normally deal with the crime scene sample, say from a human, they are flat out dealing with humans and they don't really have the skills to deal with with, with the evolutionary tree. They, they, they are focused just on, on the one species that is us and, and it, providing uh, DNA analyses around just that single species. So, so if I'm to go back um, a little bit, that, so, so the, really the theme is that you can make your own story as a scientist and, and even if you're thinking about going into science, you can make your own story. Um, the beginning for me, <laughs> this is uh, I, I th this is kind of the journey of me, the um, the five-year-old girl that that went to the local public school and then went to the local high school. Um, through a lot of that time, just I, I actually did want to be a scientist, but but for most <coughs> of my entire schooling career, I really wanted to be a dancer. <laughs> Obviously, that didn't work out so well, um, but but. Um, there, this is the kind of thing that I get to do in my, my job. I get to meet people like Sir David Attenborough and who, when he visited the museum last year. And so, so really this is a bit of an, an example of the kind of things that you can do in science and, and the kind of journey that you can go on. If you're prepared to accept the unexpected, if you're prepared to not go with the status quo and perhaps take a few risks here and there. Um, and you mentioned Chloe talk about um, <laughs> climbing up mountains in the Solomon Islands in traditional dress. I will even tell you a little bit about that. Um, and and so, so my career is basically, I'm the first woman to ever have held my role in 191 years and in fact I'm the first woman to ever be in Director of Science at any museum in our country. Um, so, so there comes a little bit of pressure with that but, but basically our underpinning principles are that we're into exploration, discovery, application and most of all collaboration because you cannot do science without working with other people these days. And there is nothing that's more relevant to this particular course than collaborations. We all need each other very, very desperately. Um, just in case you couldn't tell I'm in that photo, um, I, I will tell you about that a bit later. Uh, so, so the museum has been around for 191 years. We're the second oldest scientific institution in the country. With that comes a lot of responsibility, but also incredible opportunities. We have an incredible natural science collection that is over 21 million specimens that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's vast, it's, it goes back over nearly 191 years, although in the early days we sent everything back to London like we did with most things. Uh, and so we, we pretty much, our collections date back about 150 years. Um, and we've been going into the field for that entire time, so you can see some really old photographs of us on Lawn Howe Island, which is a very, very um, significant biodiversity, uh, in terms of biodiversity island just off um, New South Wales. But more recently we've been really trying to link that blue sky foundational science into things that are very applied, very tangible translations of our science. And those are the things kind of on the, the right hand side. So, and I, I am going to talk about those a little bit today. I'm not going to talk about bird strike, having just come on a plane and about to go, go home on a plane tonight. Um, but that is, that is something that, that we also do, and a, a tangible application of our science where, where we work with airports practically every day where we help them identify bits <laughs> that they scrape off their planes mm -hmm. so that they, ha they can understand what risks they have on their airfield. Are they hitting ibises? or, or you know, large flying foxes, or are they hitting sparrows, which are potentially smaller, l less risky, and perhaps a little bit more unusual. Uh, so, so I'm gonna tell you a story in three parts. Um, and the first one is around wildlife crime, wildlife forensics. So, so I talked to you about how this kind of all started with, with the cockatoo case. Um, but it's actually much, much bigger than that. Um, and hopefully I will convince you that it is worth caring about. Uh, it's not just some 
unfortunate individual who's doing something very awful and, and causing cruelty to a, a certain group of animals. It's actually a, a multi-billion dollar industry, unfortunately, the, the environmental or wildlife crime field. Uh, so you can see here that the figures um, from Interpol of quite a few years ago now estimate that this crime is actually worth up to 200, over $200 billion a year. Uh, and this can involve anything from uh, the trade in listed species, so things like classic things like that clouded leopard there that are um, iconic uh, endangered species, to the illegal timber trade, which you can see um, that's worth up to $100 billion per year. It's estimated there's a, there's a seriously quantifiable part of furniture that you can buy that can't legitimately show its provenance. So it's very likely to have been taken from illegal logging. Uh, in addition to that, there's illegal mining and dumping, but and also the illegal fishing industry. And so you can see each of those trades is worth many, many billions of dollars. And what makes it really complicated is that wildlife crime on, on the big scale like this is, is transnational. So it goes across countries. And so it, it's, it's considered to be the fourth most lucrative crime after people smuggling drugs and weapons. So, so it's a really big volume crime. Um, and so, hence the question, is there a need for high quality science and forensics attached to this? Uh, I think you know my answer to that. Um, and just to kind of reinforce, this is, because it's such a big transnational crime, it does tend to involve organised crime and, and attract organised crime. And this is a case from uh, close to home that's quite recent. Uh, and I know that we're not in a state that loves um, rugby league, but this, this seller here, if you do love rugby league, uh, you might recognise him. His name is Martin Kennedy. Uh, so, so a reasonable, um, a minor celebrity in terms of the sporting world. Um, he was actually charged and, and um, found guilty of some very high volume organised crime only in the last 12 months. Uh, and this involved trade between a, a range of different countries. Uh, he was shipping things in and out via the post and also via um, by, by FedEx services. Uh, it is estimated to be half a million dollars worth of, worth of wildlife. Um, and you can see the range of things that he was shipping. And, and knowing that this is very lucrative and his chances of being caught, and if he, even if he was caught, his chances of being convicted of something relatively serious were probably quite low. So this gives you an idea. This is just one example that's close to home. And there are many others that are much, much bigger on, on the global scale. Another example um, is uh, this one that happened that we were involved in a couple of years ago is, um, and this, this is something that is quite common. Uh, this fellow had, and they, they make for great headlines. Um, people do, do love bird, bird egg smugglers. Uh, this fellow had come from the Czech Republic, all from via Abu Dhabi into Sydney, and he had been at, discovered in Sydney with some irregularities in his groin region <laughs> and, and when, they, when they started investigating it they, they discovered that either side of his groin he had um, eight eggs sewn into these little, these little mesh pockets um, and so, so this is a great example that this kind of thing is seized, obviously he hasn't got any kind of appropriate permit to bring it in, it's very likely to be avian or birds so, so it's, it's definitely going to be illegal because there's lots of restrictions on importing birds illegally because they, br they can bring in all sorts of diseases, not to mention whatever species that is. If it's endangered, then there's extra penalties that are going to apply. Uh, so so we, they actually held him in custody while we did our analysis, uh, which was no pressure for us that we had to do that quickly. Um, but we, we did find using DNA analysis, so these, are little, these are eggs are only about this big, and, and um, DNA is really important in a lot of these cases, even though um, well, typically because unfortunately when something like this is, is intercepted, they euthanise it because of the quarantine risk. It doesn't matter what it is most of the time, it could be something that's highly, highly endangered, but because of the quarantine risk, they're not prepared to hatch that kind of thing out in case it carries some kind of disease. So, so that's an unfortunate consequence of the, the trade as well. Um, once we did do DNA analysis, because these things were tiny little eggs and, and they, they were just fertilised eggs, so, so not um, any kind of embryo that you could see to identify. So DNA was really important and this is what we found they were. They were um, monk parakeets, which are, which are a, a type of parrot that are native to South America. 
Uh, so they're, they're protected under the CITES Convention, which is an international convention that, that lists certain species that you can't trade unless you have a special permit. So these have a listing level two, um, and so, so that's, that's an endangered species. Uh, but interestingly, in this particular case, not only were they endangered species, but in areas where they had been introduced, they also become a biosecurity pest. So because they, they form um, they form on built infrastructure and cause, cause make a real nuisance of themselves. So this is a quite an interesting case where he not only was importing something that was protected and so illegal because it was is a protected species, but it was also a biosecurity risk. Unfortunately, the courts didn't recognise the biosecurity risk, which is interesting. Um, and he was given a 72-day custodial sentence while all of the case happened, uh, and then was deported back to the Czech Republic. Uh, incidentally, he, he um, didn't have any employment, and he'd visited Australia multiple times within the 12 months. And this is a classic example of, um, smug of a smuggler, a, a mule, basically. So it's someone that is, um, they typically, they're working for someone else. And, and th that kind of travel pattern can alert uh, authorities that, that perhaps their behaviour is unusual. I, I will leave you the judge to be the judge of whether or not 72 days in custody is an appropriate sentence. Uh, but the legislation that we have here in Australia uh, allows for much more, hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines, uh, many years in prison for these kind of offences, but, but these days we don't see those applied very frequently. So back to the, the Martin Kennedy case where there was an acknowledgement that the chances of getting caught were low and the penalties are probably going to be quite low, this is probably another example of that. So to, to kind of you know, go back to up to the global scale, um, this is a very, very confronting photo here and um, that's because this trade is very confronting and, and um, please look away if you find it too difficult to look at. Uh, but this is the global nature of this crime. Um, and most importantly, it's, it is critical that we have excellent scientific data to assist any, those that are prosecuting this crime or work with other countries that end up with these kind of crimes because, as I mentioned earlier, it's transnational. Um, so rhino poaching and is, is because of the rhino horn trade. Uh, you could see what happened to that rhino in the previous photo. They're, they're, they're usually killed, they're almost always killed um, just for the horn. Um, you could cut it, it's just like fingernails, so you could cut it off and, and the animal would be fine, but there's even enough of the horn under the skin that, that it's, it's valuable enough to, to kill an animal so that you can take it right down to, to that f previous photo. Uh, this graph here gives you an idea of the, the rate of rhino poaching in just in South Africa alone. And you can see that it's gone up every single year until the last couple of years. Although if you add in all of the other range states, such as Botswana, the rate is still continuing to go up every single year. Uh, if this happens, um, if this continues to happen, the, the, the rate of poaching will outstrip the rate of reproduction of, of rhino, which is, is quite terrifying for the survival of this, the, these species. Uh, because, in just in case you didn't know, uh, there are five different species of rhino, two in Africa and three in Asia. And um, you can see here from this slide the most the healthy populations are the white rhino, and there's estimated to be about 20,000 of them. Uh, they, they have actually recovered from a hunting bottleneck from a couple of decades ago. So, so they're, they're in the best shape. Um, so this project was done by my student, Kyle Hewitt, who you can see up in the very top corner. He's not a species of rhino. Um, and so, so the idea of this, this project for, that Kyle conducted for his honours was to develop a test where uh, you could have a rhino horn which had been seized. So rhinos are protected under the CITES Convention. Um, unfortunately, they're highly desirable in the trade for not only medicinal purposes, uh, they're, made, they're sometimes used for decorative things like bowls or dagger handles, um, and they're worth up to $75,000 a kilo. So, so they're worth more than any commodity you can possibly imagine. Um, and so, so this is unfortunately why they're targeted for the illegal trade. We don't see a lot of illegal wild, uh, rhino horn trade in Australia. We occasionally see it, but not so much. Uh, but our neighbours in Southeast Asia are, are the main demand countries. Uh, so the idea of Kyle's project was that we created something that was going to very rapidly identify one of those five species of rhino. Firstly, is it rhino? Because that's really important uh, in, in a forensic context. 
Some countries will only let you hold evidence for, for a couple of days. And so you need to very quickly and, and at least presumptively get an idea of what it is and then get a species identification so you have an idea of which country it came from, which potential population it came from, and then, then prosecutions can happen beyond that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very high value trade. And, and from a DNA perspective, it's a, it's a degraded sample type. But, so it's just like uh, extracting DNA from your fingernails or from, or from your hair. Um, there, there's DNA there, but it's not, not great quality. Um, and, and as I mentioned, it, rapid identification is really important for evidentiary purposes in a lot of our, our neighbouring countries. Um, and, and, and to be able to apply that very quickly and for it to be apl applicable in a, a lab in a developing country that perhaps doesn't have the amazing uh, sequencing equipment that we might have or, or they have to send something off to, to, and it might take several weeks, that's what we were really looking for for this project. So what he did was develop it, and this is, this is somewhat ironic that I'm speaking to uh, many people that have, are doing a hardcore bioinformatics course <laughs> for a week, a very small piece of DNA, only a couple of hundred base pairs, that he found was enough to resolve those five different species to very clearly, so in a very robust phylogeny. You can see them all up there on the, the right-hand side. Uh, so basically what we're looking for in the forensic sciences is a test that is fit for purpose, so it can, it can distinguish things apart. You can also see in there he included um, horse, because that's a common substitute. Uh, anything that's worth this much money, you're going to get substitutes. So, so horse is in there, not only as a common a substitute, but also as a reasonable outgroup. Um, it needs to be very robust. So, so it, when, you, when you're forensically validating a test, you need to understand what happens if your PCR machine is off by a couple of degrees, or what happens, what's the minimum level of detection of DNA that you can add into your reaction. Um, in addition to that, we, we, we tried to make this very collaborative across a range of different countries. So we, we involved six different uh, laboratories in five different countries, particularly in Malaysia, uh, Vietnam and uh, tai Taiwan, um, where, where these, these are places that have a very large demand for this kind of product, uh, needed to be reproducible. Um, and while we thought this was quite a fun project to do because we had a bunch of horns in our museum collection that we didn't know what species they belonged to, we actually were shocked to discover how desperately this test was needed. And before, the pub before it was even published, um, our neighbours were asking us uh, to come and train them in the test so they could use it in casework. And this is an example here for a single seizure in Vietnam um, that you can see 50 horns. Um, in a single seizure, so there you go, that, just think about that in terms of rhino Im impact. Uh, and you can see that it was able to um, detect the, the species of rhino roughly in the proportion that they exist in the wild. Obviously there's going to be more white rhinos available for poaching than black rhinos. Uh, but you can see, uh, terrifyingly, the number of individuals that are being taken out of that population. So this, is, this was actually used for prosecutorial purposes. So, so this is where, where we, are, we do a lot of forensics that, are, that do go to court, but we also do a lot of forensics that's investigative. So it's intelligence gathering or it's assisting authorities to add something else to a case, but it's potentially not going to go to court for, for, anything, for, for its specific purpose. Um, kind of like the, avia the avian um, wildlife strike, the, the, sorry, the aviation wildlife strike work that we do, that would very rarely go to court, but the airlines think that it's important enough that they use it for their, their um, risk management. Uh, this is another example. This is a, uh, these are much more in investigative uh, uses of the horn. These are horns that were from Australia. Um, and you can see here, the one on the, one on the right hand side was from the Department of Environment. They were keeping it in their safe. Um, the one on the left was actually brought to us by a private individual who had paid tens of thousands of dollars for it on, on the basis it was rhino um, and, and had had it um, carbon dated to show that it was old. So, and if something's old enough, you are allowed to legally hold it. But she really wanted to know, was it, was it rhino? Because that would then um, confirm the amount of money that she paid for it. But in fact, it was a lot of horse's hooves <laughs> glued together. So, so it wasn't even one horse's hoof. So, so um, this is a really great example that um, if you, for some reason, would like to possess something like this, it's very likely to be something that you're not. It, there's, there's, there's potentially going to be a, a bit of a truth and labelling issue. Um, so, so really this wildlife forensics journey, which, which is ongoing, and then we continue to do um, lots of work in this, in this space, um, is a really <laughs> good example of 
um, taking an opportunity when it arises or, or taking a risk. I could have very easily have said no to the police when they asked me to identify that blood sample because it wasn't really part of my job. It was potentially quite risky. Imagine if I got up in court and I was completely, um, pe completely dissected by a defence uh, bar barrister. But um, fortunately, it all worked out very well. It was clearly a niche that, that needed to be filled. Um, there, there's clearly a need for it. And, and for us, we're really excited that we can make a difference through our science and through the museum collection that's been around for more than 100 years and we continue to collect. It's a really great way for us to demonstrate to our stakeholders, so we're New South Wales government, that what we have is very important and you never know when it's going to be used for something that, that anyone might care about. Uh, so part two of my story um, is around, it, there's a bit of a theme here, risk taking. Uh, so this is, this is a very different um, risk taking moment for me. This, this happened back in 2013 um, and this is where we, I decided <laughs> let's announce that we're going to sequence a koala genome. And let, let's do that publicly because um, then, then it, you know, if, if, if anyone else is doing it then they'll know who the competition is. Um, they'll, they'll at least know that we're, we're having a crack at it. But we'd never sequenced a genome before. So, so we thought, um, rather than just like secretly beaver away for a few years and potentially get scooped, why not have a press conference, announce to the world that, that we're doing this genome. Uh, we're a small group of Australian people who think it's a good thing to do. And, and let's see how it goes from there. Um, I'm pretty sure this is where my insomnia started at this moment <laughs> because I, I don't think I've slept <laughs> particularly well for the years since then. Um, but it, it really was taking, a, it, it was one of those crossroads career moments where let's just put it all out there and see, see what, how the community feel about that. A very, very small group of, of um, scient Australian scientists decided to do this project and, <clears throat> and it was also the first time anything like this had been led by a museum, so, so a, a, a not your natural fit for a genome project, a whole genome project. And the reason that we did this project was because we were free, as a state government agency, we were frequently asked to provide advice on koala conservation. So if we put this road through this habitat, is it going to cut them in two? Is it going to create two separate, ha is, is one population going to go extinct? Are the other populations going to become completely separated from each other? Do they have any mixture at the moment? Uh, and these are questions that we would say, we can, we can start looking at it now, but we can't tell you the answer for 20 years, so, which is three koala generations. So, so we thought, why not? This is back in 2013, so genome sequencing was kind of new and fancy and no one had done the koala yet. So we thought, yeah, let, let's have a crack. And, and we can think of lots of fun things we can do with that genome. Um, in addition to that, obviously, uh, koalas are the one, they are the most recognisable <laughs> Australian species. And if there is anything that suggests that you should not hold a koala, <laughs> the, the, the better than these photos, I haven't yet seen it. Um, and so particularly the ones on the right. Um, so, so yes, for those of you who are visiting from overseas, this is several prime ministers ago on the left there. Um, <laughs> but, but, but you can see that the koalas are perhaps not that happy about being held, but they're literally a soft, a, a, a soft ambassador. So, so they're literally shoved into world leaders' arms at the G20 meeting in Brisbane a couple of years ago because they, they were, that it, was, it was soft diplomacy. <laughs> and and so, so in New, interestingly in New South Wales, you cannot do this. You're not allowed to hold koalas. You, you're allowed to touch them. <laughs> But you're not allowed to hold them, and, and I think this is a great example why you wouldn't want to do that. They don't look <laughs> particularly happy. Um, they're, they're, there's lots of the, the koala up in the top right hand corner. His name is Archer. He, he was actually voted the cutest animal in Australia a couple of years ago, uh, and you can see why. Um, and so he's a captive animal at Featherdale Zoo, um, who, who are one of the zoos that we partner with a lot. Um, so not only is this, uh, this work really important for the wild, but it's also really important for, for zoos and wildlife parks who are doing a lot of in situ management, um, potentially for a release into the wild or potentially just to make sure that their, their captive populations are not accidentally mating with close relatives. So, so there's lots of applications for this genome from a genetic perspective. 
Um, unfortunately, this is the, the extra unfortunate part about koalas. Um, it, it might interest you to know that there are fossil koalas even uh, discovered from uh, parts of Western Australia. So, so once upon a time, koalas had an Australian distribution, uh, not including Tasmania. Um, but um, we, we, unfortunately, since Europeans arrived just over 200 years ago, this is what's happened to the populations. Uh, not only do we have we cleared a lot of habitat, we put in a lot of roads, which have which cause massive impacts to koalas. Uh, they they suffer from some incredibly debilitating diseases, and you can see the example here of chlamydia. They get it in their eyes, and they also get it in their reproductive tract. Um, but w once Europeans discovered koalas um, after you, after uh, white people arrived in Australia, uh, which took about ten years, which is interesting and, and a whole different story. Um, they thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to hunt them for their fur? So, so from the late, uh, from the, the mid to late 1800s, koalas, it's estimated probably about four million koalas were hunted. Uh, and and it, interestingly, not very many of those skins still exist today. It's hard to know what happened to those skins. But, but it was, it clearly had massive impacts on the koala population. So, so from, from in the millions to, to what is estimated to be maximum 600,000 animals left now in, across the entire distribution, that, that's a pretty significant impact in a very short period of time. So, so not only de declining populations, there, there is a, a lot of attention. If we cannot get conservation of our most iconic species right, then we should we pack up and go home? We, we already have the worst mammal extinction record in the world. Uh, so, so this again was another very compelling reason for us to sequence the koala genome, which, um, as I mentioned earlier, we um, we launched <laughs> to, to big press conference uh, back in 2013 with our four partners um, down the bottom there, and, and some funding from Bioplatforms Australia and the Australian Museum Foundation, because we thought this would be a great thing to do. Um, so, five years later. Um, it did actually turn into a really amazing collaboration. So, so a great example of uh, take a risk, um, don't sleep for five years, and, and then work on something that everyone is kind of interested in. Um, and and it's, a, it's a world first, and this is how we managed to attract a lot of collaborators from all around the world. Um, and you can see the, the consortium grew to over 50 people in the five years that, that it ran. Uh, so in terms of what we found with the genome, I thought that I'd kind of vague, I'd, I'd briefly run through. Once you have a genome, you can start asking all the cool questions. And, and if I ever try and justify why we decided to do something so harebrained, um, I, I think it's because as a group of Australians, we know this animal pretty well. And, and we had a lot of talent in our team that, was, that, that understood the biology of this animal. So that once you have a really good genome, and we had, we had a, a, a very high quality genome. It was a PacBio, um, long read genome, uh, nearly 60x coverage. Uh, the the N50, N50 was 11.5 megabases. So, so a, very, a really, really high quality genome. Um, we, we thought, okay, now let's start interrogating it for what it's going to tell us about this, this wacky creature. Uh, so, so in terms of what makes a koala a koala, uh, you, you might know that when a marsupial, uh, a marsupials give birth to extremely underdeveloped young. So you can see here, uh, koalas give birth after 35 days and, and the baby is about the size of a jelly bean, so this tiny little thing that, that crawls up out of the mother's cloaca and, and it, it goes into the pouch where it attaches to one of the teats and then does its next six months of developing through the, the different uh, regime that happens in their milk. So they also don't have an immune system when they do this. So they crawl out of the pouch without an immune system. And so this was potentially something that was going to be quite cool. So, so we were able to characterise all of the immune genes, a lot, lots of immune genes that had not previously been characterised for the koala. We're also particularly related to chlamydia, able to characterise the, the suite of genes that were t the up, up or down regulated depending on whether or not animals had a uh, pathological sign of infection, or also if they had previously had an infection and had cleared it. And then also we were able to look at animals that had been vaccinated against chlamydia. So, so there's lots of things that we were able to do with the immune gene. In addition to that, I mentioned they, they do all of their developing in the pouch, so six months they, they start like this, like little jelly bean, and then they spend six months, and then finally you see them. 
But throughout that time, they've done all of this developing through a whole range of different milk proteins that happen at different developmental stages. And through that, we also found a couple of novel milk proteins. One that was absolutely specific and novel to koala, which also seemed to have antimicrobial properties. Uh, probably very important when you're climbing into a dirty pouch without an immune system and, and living there for six months. Uh, and so not only is that very important for a koala, uh, though that, um, that milk peptide appears to potentially have antimicrobial properties for things like uh, multi-resistant bacteria. So, so yay uh, koalas, they've even got something useful for humans um, through the genome. So, uh, another thing that you probably know about koalas is that, is that they have a very, very um, specific diet and um, where, where they basically, uh, they're obligate folivores, so they only eat leaves, but they're highly, highly specific as to the species of leaves that they eat. It's mainly eucalyptus um, and I can't go without showing you one gratuitous koala video, but, but this is basically when, the, when they're awake, which is not very often, they, and giving you dirty looks, um, they, when they're eating, they, they're, they're surrounded by leaves, clearly, but they're highly specific about what they're interested in eating. So that they'll stick their head into patches of leaves and they'll waft them in front of their nose until they can finally find one which they'll grab from the stalk and eat. And what we found through the genome is that they appear to have a uh, reasonably significant expansion in their bitter taste receptors, which are probably helping them choose the most nutritious leaves because we were dealing with a very calorie poor diet here. But also they're probably helping them choose leaves that have the lower, lowest amount of toxins. So, so if you're a plant, you, you're doing everything you possibly can to avoid being eaten. <laughs> so, so you're pumping out as many secondary plant, secondary metabolites as possible to, to be unpalatable. Uh, so even, even when you're a koala and that's what you do for a living, that's what you have adapted to live on, you're, you probably still want to minimise the amount of plant secondary metabolites that you're eating as part of your diet. Um, in addition to that, we found that the cytochrome P450s, which are uh, a metabolic pathway that are used for xenobiotic metabolism, so looking like me uh, metabolizing to toxins in the environment, koalas have a massive, a couple of massive expansions in one particular subfamily of these enzymes, which is which basically makes them super detoxes. Or that, well, that's what we told the media when it was published. But but, but basically that that it, they do have a very super detoxification function. And so not only do we find um, in the genome uh, significant expansions in, in uh, uh, two separate expansions in this particular subfamily of metabolic enzymes, we also found that they were expressed in all of the tissues that where you would expect, expect de detoxification to be occurring, such as the liver. Uh, so, so this is a, it, it's always really fun when you have a genome <laughs> and you can suddenly match up the genomic basis of what is a very well-known behaviour with something that you learn in the genome. So back to the, um, the conservation angle, kind of the entire reason that we started the project uh, was, was to understand what is the koala population, how does it, and, and how can we use it to conserve this species? Um, I mentioned that, that there are estimated to be maximum 600,000 animals left in the entire population. The, the lowest number could be 100,000. So, so that's a pretty big range, but, it, but it's, it's also pretty broad in terms of if it's at the lower end, we really don't have that many animals to, to play with and, and conservation is very, very imperative. Uh, so in terms of the genome, we, uh, we managed to get animals, just in case you, you need a refresher on the distribution of koalas, this is basically where they occur now, right around here. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier was when, when the, all the hunting happened in the late 1800s and, and early 1900s, the South Australian koalas were completely wiped out from hunting. They, they were, there were no koalas left by, the early, by about 1912. Uh, and the majority of the Victorian koalas were wiped out. There was one population, or a couple, probably a couple of populations in the Gippsland area that, that we think are endemic, so, so they're not, not ones that were wiped out. Um, but it, so all of these animals here, that you, particularly in South Australia, they've all come from a bunch of very enthusiastic citizen scientists that realised in the early 1900s that they were going to go extinct in some of those areas. So they took a few individuals, not knowing anything about the importance of avoiding inbreeding. Um, they took a few individuals and just started breeding them up 
And, and those are the animals that have repopulated most of Victoria. Uh, and those are the animals that, that entirely populate South Australia these days. Uh, and you can see that here. What we've got on this graph is uh, basically a level of inbreeding. So in this particular case, high is not good uh, because you can see anything that is, is orange has a very high level of inbreeding because it reflects those original animals that were bred up and translocated all over the place. So any of you that live in uh, Victoria and South Australia, uh, you're probably more likely to see a koala in the wild than any of us in New South Wales or Queensland because they're, they're very abundant, but you can see that they're all very, very related. Um, and this, for, for a long-term conservation perspective, this is not super great. Um, if you think about the Tasmanian devil, uh, that's a great example of a highly, a highly inbred species because it was isolated on an island. Not, not humans weren't solely responsible for that one. But um, they basically have no, no diversity at their immune genes. So when something like the transmissible facial cancer came along, that, uh, basically, they couldn't recognise it as, as non-self. And so, so this is a consequence of inbreeding. Uh, in addition to that, there's lots of uh, very well-known descript descriptions of things that are well, very well known to be associated with inbreeding. So, so skull um, abnormalities where their skull is twisted, so, so they would have trouble eating, which, and basically you have to eat a lot to, to get enough calories to survive on the diet that they have. They eat almost 10% of their body weight every day in leaves. Uh, so a skull morphology uh, deformation is, is going to have welfare issues. Uh, they have um, reproductive abnormalities where, where they have undescended testes and, and other kind of infertility issues. So, so abundance does not necessarily mean health for ongoing conservation. Um, so now, now to the other animals. So this is, this is the rest of the population. So most of these are still um, endemic animals. So most of them are are animals that, that haven't been moved by humans, although we are discovering that humans do like to move koalas around a fair bit. Um, and through the genome, we've, we've got some really high resolution markers where we can start to see different populations, but we can also see that there's, there's been a long-term continuity across that habitat. So, so we can see that, that while koalas, they don't move much because they sleep most of the time, they, they, do, they, 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 they move enough to exchange genes. So before we came in and, and seriously altered their habitat, there, there was a lot of exchange across the landscape. And of course, they've been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years, way pre-European uh, settlement and even pre-Aboriginal um, occupation or Aboriginal settlement of Australia. So, so some of the lessons that we came out, out of the koala genome, uh, it's most definitely a story of collaboration and, and conservation, we hope. Um, and that's because we, these, very excitingly for us, the genomic data has now been integrated at least into New South Wales government policy. Um, a couple of years ago, a paper came out saying, that there was the one that described how many koalas are probably left. Um, and it's also said uh, koala populations will decline by 50% in Queensland over the next three koala generations, which is only 20 years. And they will decline by 30% in New South Wales. And so that was enough for our government to realised that they needed to do something fairly rapidly. And, and excitingly for us as scientists, they did recognise that the genome was a significant science project that could also be useful to them. So, so they have actually integrated genomic data into koala management uh, in New South Wales going forward. Um, so, so it will somehow interact with how roads are being built and how other built infrastructure interacts with koalas. Uh, and, and w there will be an ongoing biobank where, where samples are collected and, and um, those animals are monitored. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, what we can show is that even though we have seriously modified the landscape over, only in the last less than 200 years, uh, there, there, it is imperative that we, we maintain this long-term connectivity because that's what's been happening. And if we disrupt that after hundreds of thousands of years, uh, why, what are we even trying to conserve? And of course, um, I, I, you can see from the number of collaborators that we had that it, it absolutely takes a village to sequence a genome. Uh, so, so from all of those sleepless nights that I had all of those years ago and continue to have, um, it, it really has been a really great project. And um, if, I'm, if, if you want advice, if any of you are thinking of doing anything this crazy, uh, my advice to you would be, yes, go for it. <laughs> go for it. Because these are, these are some of the great outcomes. Um, these are kind of the science metrics that, that we, would, we would be impressed with. Um, uh, the museum is very impressed that we got over 700 million media impressions. 
uh, because it turns out everyone loves a world first, which the koala genome was when it was published uh, in July this year. Um, and they're pretty cute, so, so it doesn't really matter what you're doing with a koala, probably the media is going to pay attention. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it has been integrated into government policy, which, which is, is very important that our science is not just in scientific journals, that it actually is translated into things that do make a difference. Um, and, and probably the absolute highlight for me was uh, when, when the journal accepted our paper and, and you go through this conversation where you say, oh, I, I wonder if you would like a photo of a koala to go on the cover. Uh, the journal actually said to us, we would like to commission an Aboriginal artist to draw a koala to have on our cover, which was an incredibly inspired um, choice. Um, and so, so they asked us if we could suggest a few artists. Um, they ended up choosing um, a local artist from the Redfern area, so just right near the museum, uh, named Black Douglas. Um, and this is, his, um, this is the, the artwork that was on the front cover of the journal. Um, this is very, very significant because Aboriginal people have, we, have we're, we proudly have the longest continuous culture here in this country, who have had such a long-term sustainable interaction with wildlife, with flora and fauna. Um, and so it was, it was particularly significant to have him depict uh, the koala. Um, it's not an accident that it looks like a target. So, so this is his, um, his comment on conservation. Um, but, but a very special moment to have nature and, and, and our, our cultural, our deep cultural history um, combined for our publication. So finally, the, the third part of my story is, is, a, is something completely different. Uh, it's, it is about uh, working with community and, and helping them and enabling them to do projects that, that are, again, completely aligned with our strategy at the Australian Museum Research Institute, which are uh, preserving biodiversity but also preserving culture. Uh, so this is a group, this, this is a, a community in the Solomon Islands in, on the island of Malaita, which is a, a, a quite a remote, it's a big island, but a, a quite a remote island in the Solomon Islands. Uh, where they still have a lot of land. So, so the um, chief Esau here at the front, he's one of the, the 12 big landholders on this island in, in this particular community that we work with. And they have massive, massive plots of land which has not been logged. Unfortunately, lots of parts of the Solomon Islands uh, through, through difficulties in making a living or, or not being able to grow enough food or not having, having sustainable agriculture or any other source of income, they have sold a lot of their land for logging. Uh, this community we started working with quite a few years ago uh, through a connection with Tim Flannery, the former Australian of the Year, who he also used to work at the Australian Museum as a mammalogist. Um, so Tim had done work here uh, in the 1980s and 1990s and really wanted to go back to those communities and basically empower them and, and support them in the conservation projects that they had. Uh, so a very, the project is basically hinging around rats and bats. Um, and these, these are the, the beasties here. Um, and so, so this, the, the Solomon Islands, which is an entire archipelago, if you can imagine uh, Papua New Guinea right at the top of Australia and it looks like a bird and there's a tail that goes all the way down or like this. Uh, Solomon's is kind of that archipelago going down the tail. Uh, they have an extraordinary diversity of, of uh, fauna and flora, um, but they have these amazing endemic rats and bats. And some of them are enormous. The, the rat in the middle is about this, the body is about this big, and, and, and uh, the tail is, all, is about that big too. Um, and, but unfortunately, they're fairly rare these days. The last time one of these was seen, was um, in 2002. Uh, and it was seen by Esau, by Chief Esau, who was in the previous photo. Um, but so the project was all about um, basically working with the community that we're, we're really supportive that you want to conserve your land, that you don't want to sell it for logging, but you're trying to figure out other sources of income that are going to sustain you, so, but also support your conservation, but also support your traditional culture. If you've ever visited anywhere in the Pacific, you probably haven't seen too many people basically naked because, because the vast majority of the, that area was, missionary, was missionized in the, in the early 1800s. Um, so these guys, interestingly, because they live in the mountains, which is very remote, they, they also ha still have maintained, they have a continuous culture and they have done so for many, many, many generations. 
And so they still practice all of those cultures um, in, in the face of being told not to for a long time. Uh, so this project was very much about supporting them in conserving their land uh, through, con through basically telling them how awesome their, their wildlife is. Uh, this is, this is. So these are the rats. Uh, these are the monkey-faced bats. Uh, so, and they're, they're like a gigantic flying fox. So the body on these things is about this big too. Um, and again, these haven't really been seen for probably about a decade, but there's still a chance that they're there because they're, they're, a lot of this habitat is still quite pristine. But these people, um, they, they, they have to live off their land. So, so they have gardens, they do eat a lot of these things. Uh, you can talk to most, a lot of people that have, can tell you what these taste like, uh, particularly in other areas where they're not quite so rare. Um, so that's a bit more of a close up of the, the monkey face bats and the giant rats. Um, and and so, so not only do we have the great um, experience of bringing a lot of people from these communities into our collection, uh, so they come to visit us, they wear a traditional dress, so this is them in Sydney. Uh, it's pretty awesome walking through the streets of Sydney with these guys, they, they get a lot of attention. Um, but it's also really amazing going into the collection, so, so we have um, all these specimens in, our, in drawers. Um, that big black rat that I showed, that this one here, this was collected in the 1930s. Uh, and so, so to go into the collection and talk to these guys, these guys are from Bougainville, they, who, who still have a reasonable number of these rats, they put, them on fa they put photos of them on Facebook and overnight people started commenting going, oh yeah, I know where those rats live, they really hurt when they bite you, or, but th there's lots of meat on them. And so, so it was a really amazing example of something that, that for us is quite rare, we can actually get complete and instant community engagement and community information through working with these communities and, and providing what is really important for them. There's no point us telling them what, how we think they should conserve their land because they're the ones that have to, to, to survive, they're the ones that have to feed themselves and, and have a sustainable living. So it's really important that we do something that is supporting what, what they need. Um, and so, uh, Science really can take you anywhere. Uh, I know, so I'm a geneticist, so I don't go in the field very much. And you probably don't want to look too closely at the photo at the top, but that's me in traditional dress giving a speech. <laughs> 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 so it completely turns on its head the idea of um, imagining the audience naked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can see here, it was a, uh, it, it takes, it's about a thousand metres to, to walk to this community. So, so for me as a very inept uh, Westerner, it, that took about eight hours to walk up this mountain. Um, and, and so, but when we got to the top of the mountain, uh, they, they very rarely have visitors and they very, very rarely, have never seen a senior female before. So, so that was also very unusual, but completely embraced and accepted. Uh, so, so it was very humbling to have a, again, it's not hard to tell which one's me, um, but it was very hard, very humbling to have a welcome from the chiefs, they'd walked for days to come to, to have this special celebration with us and to, to welcome me as a, as a visitor from the Australian Museum because they know that we are the custodians of a lot of what they have. And, and for probably the first time, they had a lot of support from us that their traditional practices were very special, that they should be um, continued and, and, and a lot of cultures have lost them, unfortunately. And again, it's that these guys um, have started travelling since, since we started this project, but how on earth would they know that other cultures have, have been lost through being disconnected or through, through changes and, 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 and westernisation of culture? So, so it was a, it's a very special project. It's still ongoing. Um, this is an example. This is a view from the mountain when you get up there, but, and, but you basically have to walk from there. <laughs> so, so it's a very long way. Um, and, and as part of that, we've also... Um, worked with them to develop a school. So not only do they, the children would have to previously walk to the coast, so, so for, the, for the very locally adapted um, uh, uh, Malaysians, that, that takes a couple of hours. So it only takes about three hours for them, eight hours for me. But that's still a really long way to go for school. And so, so to have a local school that's uh, in the mountains, that's teaching the local language, um, and, and not just uh, English and Pidgin, which is what's on the coast, is again really special and a really, uh, great way of us supporting what they do in a way that is really meaningful and important to them. Um, so, so I think, I think the, the theme of my talk has been pretty clear, that, that the science horizon is very vast, uh, particularly if you are prepared to look beyond the traditional. Uh, and, and I've certainly made a career of it to date, um, and hopefully that won't change anytime soon. 
Uh, so anything from kind of wildlife forensics to working with the aviation industry to, to deciding to just go out there and announce that you're sequencing a genome. Um, it, all of these things are possible, and, and particularly if you can see a niche for your science or a niche that's kind of not being filled, or if you're prepared to be uh, completely disparaged by your colleagues because you're mad. Um, there's, the, 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 the horizon is, is practically unlimited if you're prepared to think a little bit outside of the box. Um, for, from, a C, from a female perspective and, even, and, and more broadly from a diversity perspective, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, um, as I, I think you're probably all familiar with these statistics that, that there's very few um, number of female senior academics. Uh, similarly, you can say, say the same for a lot of the diversity statistics. Um, and I was part of a project called the Superstars of STEM um, initiative that, that um, for the past 12 months. And they started that initiative because of things like this, that 11 only 11% of science media quotes female scientists. But, but we might actually make up a lot more than that. And, and so it was addressing a lot of these unconscious biases that, that were, most of us were completely unaware of. And in fact, a lot of science journalists were shocked to find out that they, were, and they went back through their own articles and realised that they, even though they thought of themselves as being incredibly um, inclusive, they, their articles reflected these same statistics. And it's just a matter of, again, breaking outside of the status quo and breaking outside of your, your traditional network and thinking a little bit more broadly, because the more diverse you are, the more benefit you're going to have. Science is completely relies on collaboration, um, and, and the more diversity you have, the better the collaboration is going to be. Business, the more diversity you have, that they have, the more money they make. That, that, those are relatively well-known statistics. Um, gender, gender equal boards make more money uh, as far as public companies go. Um, and so, so things like 92% of the most sci followed scientists on Twitter are male. And, and this is, these are easy things for us to be, acknowledge and think differently about. So, so think about following more female scientists and, and think about your own actions. Um, I know that I, I catch myself all the time with unconscious behaviour that I'm not even aware of um, in terms of language. Uh, but most importantly, it doesn't matter what kind of scientist you are or, or, or what, what kind of diversity metric you fit yourself into, in, if any. Um, the most important thing for us to do as scientists is communicate what we do. Uh, because unless we, if we're only talking to ourselves or to our very small networks, then um, the message is not going very far. And what we do is really, really important. So, so that, that again is my, that's my preachy part done. Um, just in case you're wondering what I think my greatest achievements to date are, um, there, yes, I'm very proud of the, starting the wildlife forensics lab at the museum and it's an accredited laboratory and the koala genome, et cetera. Uh, but most definitely my proudest achievement is, is the amazing people that, that work for me and, and the incredibly talented young scientists that, that work in my lab and, and are doing the kind of work that I'm telling you about today. Um, and of course my, my wonderful students who, who are the, the excellent scientists of the future. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention um, and I'd also like to acknowledge all of my collaborators from the Koala Genome Consortium and happy to take questions if we've got time. <laughs>